Good Monday morning of the 32nd week in Ordinary Time. It's going to be a little string here. A lot of the applied letters, I know they call them pastoral letters by St. Paul. And the readings from Luke are good too. This, is too provoc- this one here is fun though for me. And Eric, let me read it to you, okay? This is the beginning of the letter of Paul to Titus, one of his, you know, he was his disciple. So he, <laughs> let me just read. He says, Paul, a slave of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's chosen ones and the recognition of religious truth in the hope of eternal life, the God who does not lie promised before time began, who indeed at the proper time revealed his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted by the, by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Now here's the part that gets really good, okay? You gotta see that he's writing in the real context of the early church. It's not an ideal letter. It's not an ideal in the sense of some kind of theoretical. <laughs> he's trying to keep his people straight, okay? This is neat. This is really neat. I love this letter. I love what he, how he does it. He's got his hands full. He, he, I'll read it to you. For this reason, I left you in Crete so that you might set right what remains to be done. You've got to take care of things. And appoint presbyters, priests, okay? In every town as I directed you, but on certain conditions. Now, here are the conditions. This is great, okay? On condition that a man be blameless, married only once, with believing children who are not accused of licentiousness or rebellious. They've got, to keep, they've got to be good kids, you know what I mean? Don't get out of line. Now watch what he says about bishops, okay? <laughs> they ought to plaster this on every seminary wall, in the monasteries, in the seminaries, and on the, uh, every wall of a, a, a priesthood, you know, every rectory and whatever. For a bishop, as God's steward, must be blameless, not arrogant, not irritable. This is the best part. Not a drunkard, not aggressive, not greedy for sordid gain, but hospitable, a lover of goodness, temperate, just, holy and self-controlled, holding fast to the true message as taught so that he will be able both to exhort with sound doctrine and to refute the opponents. See, you know, one of the guy in there is a drunk. <laughs> I'm laughing, but I'm not. I am. I get a kick out of it, I have to say. Because in one way, he's facing the reality of the flesh of the church. And he's dis- he is trying to encourage excellence in the face of the flesh of reality. The church is never free of its flesh. That's its beauty. We're not innocent. That was the great, the most important lesson I think I had to learn when I joined the order. Because I was, I was 17 years old. I was very, very idealistic, if not naive. We were protected in so many ways. We, the church idealized its, its leadership. So we had our Bishop Fulton Sheens, et cetera, you know, awesome. And we had John the 23rd, you know, Pius the 12th, all that. We didn't see the flesh of the church, or if we saw it, we saw it in the confessional, and we were the flesh of the church confessing our sins. You see, that, I'm glad in a way it came to an end because we saw the holiness of the church is in its redemptive power, not its innocence. And I, I think that I had to learn that lesson in the monastery. As much as, as students, we didn't call ourselves seminarians, as we were students in student life that 10 years of formation, we lived in our monasteries. We lived in the community. And the community was the greatest of all the teachers. But they taught us by living with the flesh and the excellence of the church, and you couldn't tell the difference. I told you that story so many times. Some of the best men I ever lived with were the men who struggled the most. Yeah, they struggled with their vocations. They struggled with alcohol. There was a time that was a pretty serious problem. 
But yet some of the men that struggled the most with the alcohol were some of the best men to live with, that we lived with. As one guy, one of our leaders, one of our, it was one of our directors, said about one of our pa fellow passionists, okay, who had just died, he was an old man, he just died. And he, he was a heavy drinker and all the rest. I mean, he was a man who struggled with his humanity. And I remember what, he, what the director said after the funeral. He was, we were in class, and he said, it was a pleasure to live with. That man was a pleasure to live with. And I thought, you know what? That counted for everything. Nobody was denying anything about him, his successes and his failures. But when you wrapped it all together, he was a good guy. It was a pleasure to live with. He was a good monk. That means a lot. In religious life, that means a ton. Because there's no hypocrisy in it. If you're a good guy, a good gal, that's the testimony of the community with you, that you were a pleasure to live with. You were a good soul. The Germans say, I'm a good mensch, a good human being. And in that goodness, you were holy not by piety, but by the authenticity of your life. That's the truth. I think I learned that also in the neighborhood, in Ward Street on New Haven. You saw, you saw all kinds of people, all kinds of problems, but you also saw their fidelity to their families, their fidelity to the struggle of life, especially when you had alcohol abuse. I look back and I'm sorry for the failures, but it was good to be with them. And I honor them in memory and I pray for them, but I also pray with them. I hope I will persevere in my vocation like they persevered in theirs, imperfectly, but faithfully. They taught me what life was. It's redemption and struggle and success. But it isn't innocence, and I never look for innocence again. I don't, I don't believe in it. That's the doctrine of original sin. Okay? We're all flawed, but in our flaws, we are also open to the sacred. The humility of humanity is in its sinfulness, and the hope of humanity is in redemption. It can't be redeemed from innocence. The day, greatest danger to Redemption is the belief that you're innocent. Because you're not. Well, none of us are innocent. We are all fallible human beings who struggle to be good, struggle to be faithful. And so, in that manner, maybe very much like the apostles, I think of St. Peter, he's my favorite. Because he was a stumble bum, but in the end he died on the cross upside down. In the end, he was faithful, always faithful. Stubborn, stubborn, you know, stubbing his toe along the way, but he always kept walking. That's the story of life. The holiness of life is in the fidelity to the journey. For most of you that are listening, it's in your families. For me, it's in the priesthood and religious life, the professoriate, whatever. Our way. I love the song by Sinatra. When I die, I want them to play that record over me. <laughs> he did it his way because we pursue our vocations, each in our own way, but always in a positive pursuit of what is good and true and beautiful, our way.